when I was born. That's the reason I'm howling. We're talking about the life of a human being, how they live. A lot of people's wondering, what is the blues? I hear a lot of people saying the blues, the blues. But I'm going to tell you what the blues is. When you ain't got no money, you got the blues. When you ain't got no money to pay your house rent, you still got the blues. A lot of people holler about, I don't like no blues, but when you ain't got no money and can't pay your house rent and can't buy you no food, you damn sure got the blues. If you ain't got no money, you got the blue, cause you're thinking evil. That's right. Anytime you're thinking evil, you thinking about the blues. Well, when we first started playing together, we started playing because we wanted to play rhythm and blues, and Howling Wolf was one of our greatest idols, and it's a great pleasure to find he's been booked on this show tonight. It really is a pleasure. Thanks to Howling Jack. couldn't say that would get them in trouble. Or they want to get back at their boss. Mm. They would sing. But I was doing right. You could believe what I say. When I'm doing right, you could believe what I say. Everything you possess and don't need nothing, you don't have no right to worry about nothing. But when you ain't got nothing, then you got to worry about something. And that's why the blues come in. And Lord, first thing is that you know I don't have this. And I don't have that. And you look over there at these other people and they got this and got that. Then in your heart you feel like that you ain't nobody. You got the blues. Well, frankly, the blues ain't nothing but the feeling. Mm. When you got a good girl on your mind, mm. something like that. But music has a way of uh, relaxing your mind against the speed. Mary and Martha, they dance to see. Say, go tell my disciples. 
to meet me in Galilee. Now who's that right? John the Revelator, tell me who's that right? John the Revelator, tell me who's that right? John the Revelator wrote the book of the seven seas. Who's that right? John the Revelator, tell me who's that right? John the Revelator, well, who's that right? John the Revelator wrote the book of the seven seas. And sitting here playing the blues, and I play church songs too. But you can't take God and the devil along together, because them two fellas, they don't, they don't uh, communicate together so well. They don't get along so well together. died when I was six years old. Wolf looked at Hewitt like, like, like his son. He taught me a lot, man. He taught me a lot about music, uh, you know, guitar and everything. Oh, our big brother. He That's our brother. Our He's big our big brother. brother. Yeah. You know, he and Hubert always had their fights, but they loved each other to the bitter end. It was and Hubert had his back and he <laughs> had Hubert's right, back. That's healthy. for sure, you know. Well, the words, I knew what he was going to do before he did it. You know, <laughs> that's just like that's just like father and son, man. Wolf was like the biggest guy I'd ever met. He would come in and shake my hand, and I would always it was like putting my hand in a baseball glove. It was that big. If you say something to him, you better be right. You better say it to him right. You know what I'm talking about? Do he walk off and he, hey man, nice knowing you. He was like a man that just didn't take in the mess. It was like flipping a coin with Wolf. He had this sweet, quiet side to him, and he had this tough, big, intense side to him that could be triggered. He was a no-nonsense type of guy, you know. A lot of people, the musician thought he was hard, hardly, but he wasn't. He just ran the band like a band should be run. On stage, he was a wild man. Um, he was like a feral beast stalking the stage. He was the wolf. He did his acts and people just went, wow. He could rouse an audience. He'd walk that bar, he'd crawl it, and jump up and down on it. And then he'd go out the door, hollering out there on the street, blowing his hammer, because he had a long cord on his microphone. He had, you know, the, the Coke bottle in his pants and, and, and crawling around. But he was, he was a hell of a entertainer. Then he'd take, it, take his handkerchief and stick it down in the, in the back of his belt like a tail and start howling up and down the bar. But off stage, he was a very uh, hardworking, um, kind of a straight-laced guy. He did he transform from what I remember, you know, from dad to the stage the person. But uh, I think that was just a part of his spirit. I think that there, there was some kind of gift there that just it had manifested itself into, you know, when he got there, he knew that was his job. And he knew people expected a lot. They paid their money. They wanted to go out and have a good time. Now listen, peoples. I'm going to show you how to play the blues. Now you just sit here and watch me. You know when you got a lazy woman, then you have to come in and tell us that. Baby, why don't you sweep up the house? jump up and tell you, sweep it up yourself. I'm gonna get up in the morning. I believe I dust my broom. I'm gonna get up in the morning. I believe I dust my broom. I'm quitting the gal I'm loving while my friends get 
I might get a mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veely now. He would just love going back down south for hunting and fishing. He was a country guy, deep down. That's when you could see him relax. You know, the, yeah, the outdoor, you know, he just, he appreciated that kind of thing. And he was just, he was just a laid back. Never was, uh, I can't remember anything elaborate. It was always laid back, always laid back. I think he appreciated everything more than people mm -hmm. knew because of, you know, the meager be uh, beginnings he had. And, and again, he, I don't think he took anything for granted. As we said, he enjoyed life, but never extravagantly. Say he drove a Pontiac station wagon all his life. There were never any Cadillacs and Mercedes. You know what I said? He was just a down-to-earth man, you know. Me, I just like, I'm on blue. As I read and I play him, I come up hard. Suffered a lot of places. Person ain't never had no hard time, but they don't know what the blues mean anyway. Well, I was born in uh, Albany, Mississippi. That's between Memphis and Jackson on Highway 45 going south. He got the name Wolf uh, from his, uh, his grandfather, John Jones, who lived down in Sugarlock, Mississippi, down in Noxabee County. He gave me that name. He used to sit down and tell me tall stories about what the wolf would do, you know, because I was a bad boy, you know. So he told me the story about how the wolf done the little red riling hood. And then they finally killed the wolf and drove him up to the house, you know, and showed me the wolf. And I told him it was a dog. He said, no, that's a wolf. I said, well, what do a wolf do? Say, how? He said, mm -hmm. you know, and so uh, I got afraid of this wolf, you know. And every time I'd kill some of my mother's chickens, she said, mm -hmm. so that would scare me, you know, and it made me mad, and it's when they called me wolf. I was born in a little town called Rolling Fork, and I was raised up in the Clarksville. I raised up out on a Formal, 
Because I know that little kid, 10 years old, out there working, you know, on the phone. On the phone you know. I lived the country life for a long time. A little rough, but yeah. came through it. Black kids in Mississippi at the time had it hard. You know, all black people in Mississippi did. But uh, I think Wolf had it harder than most. When he was a little kid, his parents split up, and he was raised for a while uh, by his mother, Gertrude. <laughs> His mother was a religious person, kind of a religious fanatic. At some point, Gertrude got angry with him, supposedly about the fact that he wouldn't work on the farm, and she forced him out of her house. He, he told me, crying. He said, Hubert, she put me out on the kind I wouldn't work for 15 cents a day. And told him, don't come back. Said, don't, I don't want you back here. He ended up moving in with his uncle, Will Young, who lived in White Station. And Will Young mistreated him really badly. And I think uh, Wolf was really scarred by that. He eventually ran away from his uncle, actually, when he was about 13. And he rejoined his father uh, in the Delta. He didn't have no shoes. And he bought 75 miles, which it is from now, to West Point. He had a father who loved him. His father was, you know, uh, from everything we've heard, was a wonderful guy. And he had, uh, his father had a large family, and Wolf, you know, he had finally found, found a home. He was flying, flying four mules on the plantation. Man come through there picking a guitar called Charlie Patton. And I liked it in sound. Will you kill a man? Yes, I will. Dead by the heart. I mean, I'm a fool about my heart. Don't take me long to get my So I always did want to play a guitar. So I got him to show me a few chords, you know. Every night that I'd get off of work, I'd go over to his house and he'd learn me how to pick the guitar. So I got good with it. So I went out for myself. And the people went for what I was putting down. And I decided that uh, I would play. So I asked my father to get me a guitar. 1928, the 15th day of January. He went and got me a guitar, and uh, I started picking the guitar first. I'm a wolfed hound. They found me howling at your door. I'm the wolfed hound, baby. They found me howling at your door. She was kind of nice to me, and she pulled off and left me. And that gave me the blues show enough. I went to howling like a dog then, you know. He also traveled around with Robert Johnson. The Wolf did travel with him, and Johnson used to back him on guitar, and Wolf would sing. Wolf also played with um, Sunhouse and uh, Willie Brown. Uh, they used to play together up in Robinsonville. I played all through Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, 
and and uh, around in Kentucky, but I played all over the the cotton belt countries, you know. During World War II, he uh, ended up in Seattle and Oregon. I stayed in the army three years. I done all my training, you know. And yeah, I like the army, all right, but they, they put so much on a man, you know what I mean? And uh, my nerves couldn't take it, you know. They uh, they drilled us so hard, it just not to give me a nervous breakdown, you know what I mean? Late in the evening, and the sun is sinking down. After World War II in Mississippi, the whole agricultural scene was changing. I mean, it was all being mechanized, and people were being thrown out of work. And since they were being thrown out of work, there was less money for a Delta player. I mean, the old juke joints were closing down. People didn't have money to throw around. And people were moving to the cities. And so one of the first cities they moved to from uh, the Delta was Memphis. <laughs> We've got the father of waters here. I believe it's known as the mighty old muddy Mississippi. We got the Delta land. We got blacks and whites. Now you get the augmentation of people from southeast Missouri, northwest Alabama, northern Mississippi, eastern Arkansas, northeast Louisiana. Now what more do you need? Bill Street back in the 40s and early 50s was like so thick, you couldn't walk down the street hard on Saturdays. People's happy and having a good time all up down Bill Street. Now, Memphis itself was a pretty uh, closed town. There was a curfew there for black people after 11 o'clock at night. But West Memphis was wide open. There was money there, uh, gambling, all sorts of vice. And so it was a good place for a musician to go and make money. His band was the hottest thing going in West Memphis, and West Memphis was where all the money was. It was just a juke joint. It might have been an old house out in the woods, especially Friday and Saturday nights were, were big nights, you know, especially for, because we played for mostly all blacks all the time, you know, and uh, uh, you might have a kitchen over to the side of the bandstand, and back in the back, uh, a house where they put the call shooting crap. And out in the front of the little bandstand, that's where everybody danced. They were also extremely dangerous. People had guns and knives. People got hurt all the time in those places. I mean, everybody was drinking corn liquor and getting kind of crazy. We've had 30 minutes on the air on this radio station in, in West Memphis, Arkansas. And he give us 15 minutes. You could James Cotton 15 minutes on the album with us in the band, you know? Man, I thought that was great back then. We was kids, you know? Some days we'd go over there and, and, and we'd play the show with him, play live music. And he actually um, got, the, got the advertisers himself. He'd do this Highland thing, you know, like Wolf, you know, when he come on there, and go, oh, you know, do this Wolf thing. And he would say, this here's a Wolf coming at you, honey. I was playing on the same radio station he was playing on at that time. I was playing country music, and he would do his flute stuff, and then uh, after we would leave, we'd get off there. So one day I was playing with his country band, and he came in the studio early one day, and he stood outside the window, and he was laying upside the wall. And so I put some blues licks on the guitar, and I looked up to at him, you know, and he did like that, you know. And, and so when I went outside the studio, and he said, I like the way you play guitar, and I said, thank you. You know, I said, I like the way you sing, too. I said, I've been listening to you on the way home, you know. So, uh, so uh, he said, well, how about coming back there and play some blues with her today? And I said, okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Sam Phillips heard from one of his friends that there was this guy in the radio, uh, this guy who called himself Howling Wolf. And Sam tuned in one day and was just blown away by Wolf's voice, as everybody was. Chester Burnett, one of the greatest artists I ever recorded in my life. They cut a couple of demos, and uh, Sam Phillips sent them off to, I believe he sent them off to RPM Records, uh, which was a Los Angeles company run by the Bihari brothers. And they were interested. Sam brought Wolf back in and did a full session. And um, out of that came Moanin' at Midnight and How Many More Years, his first record. How many more years have I got to let your dog be around? to let them know that I wanted to hear what they heard and not to try to please a white man because he happened to quote unquote be in the control room and in control of the session. Sam Phillips actually ended up sending that to the Chess Brothers rather than to the Baharis. So that started a bidding war, especially when the record took off. It ended up being a big hit. <laughs>
the Chess Brothers really wanted them, and so did uh, the Bih Bihari Brothers. It fomented a bidding war, and what happened was the Chesses ended up with uh, Wolf in return for the Bih Bihari Brothers getting Roscoe Gordon, who was also recording for Sam Phillips. And that's when uh, Wolf decided to move to uh, Chicago. Putting this is what he said, young man, I'm putting the band down, I'm going to Chicago. If I send for you, will you come? Cotton looked at me. Hey, man, how you I go? See, you'll make more money with him, you will me. <laughs> he made lots of money. Wolf always said that uh, I'm the onlyest one that drove out of the Delta on my own. And that's what he did when he moved to Chicago. He drove up there in his own car. He said he had $4,000 cash in his pocket, which back then was, you know, uh, a huge fortune. <laughs> from Poland, from a small village in Poland, and came to the west side of Chicago. And the, some of the first people they met were black people. Some of the first music they heard was black music. Being that there were no blacks in Europe where they came from, it was a whole new experience. No uh, premeditated prejudice at all existed. My family came to America. The blacks came to Chicago for a main reason, to make money. These uh, black or blue singers probably lived in one room without electricity in the South, and just like my family did in Poland. So Chicago was a place where the jobs were here, and there was, uh, everybody was from the South. So they all had a, a, a bond there. It was good to be away from down there, but it was good to hear the music, and, and there was a certain amount of freedom in Chicago. <laughs> wanted to be on chess because we they wanted to make money they wanted to hit and we wanted the hits I just was always there because it was the family business in a way it could have been a grocery store you know Wolf Muddy Sonny Boy Chuck Berry Bo Diddley they were at chess records when they were in Chicago they were there numerous times a week and I got to know them but through the eyes of a child and quite uh, in thinking back I realized that most of the things they discussed with me was Wanted to know my sex life. Did I get any yet? Had I had any yet? How did I like it? I went into the studio one day, and there Wolf was. He had just got here from down south. And uh, he was here by himself, and he was going to need some musicians. So Little Chess hooked us up. He found me when I first got with him on the counter. I played with a straight pick, and I run all over me, and he couldn't get his voice out. He said, you fired. He said, I tell you, young man, although I got you here, you go home. Put the pig down, number one. So cry your fingers, you know? Number two, he said, listen to the record. He said, when you come back, he said, you're going to be all right. He said, you may learn something. Sure enough, I found myself, man. I found my tone. I put the picks down. I ain't thought of them picks no more. I had the sound. I had everything that he needed. So, from here on, just like that, man. Even though Hubert and I played in the same band, our, I think our, our styles are different. But the two of us together combined in the band made, made the band sound good. <laughs> Dum, dum, boom, 
That's, and that's the basis of the song. He was into self-improvement. He went to school late in life. He never got any schooling as a kid, so he was basically functionally illiterate until he was, you know, probably in his, in his 50s. He went to school five years uh, for music and, and, and three years for, for learning. I'd read and write, arithmetic, subtract, multiply. When we was playing at Silvio's, there was three, three bands, Muddy's band, Wolf's band, and my band. And on intermission, he'd have on his glasses, and he'd be sitting at the table going over his, his, his lesson. That guy learned how to write, read, and, and no kidding, and learn his guitar. But Wolf ran a, a, a really tight band. And I mean, the guys, uh, he paid them well, and they worked six, seven nights a week. He always, he's always had a job working all over Chicago. <laughs> Known. And then after he recorded that smokestack lightning, he was really well known. And we played a place here in Memphis called the Hippodrome, which was down on Bill Street. And that that particular time, we drew more people than anyone that had ever been in in uh, the Hippodrome. Well, smokestack lightning means as a train, you know that. Uh, or runs on the rail, you know. I met uh, Lily in 1957, uh, I believe. She, she had gone out to a club with, uh, I think, her brother, uh, where Wolf was playing, and she didn't normally go out to blues clubs. She was a very straight-laced lady. And Wolf saw her, and, you know, Lily was a beautiful woman, and he was smitten. The opposites attract, right? They always say. And uh, I guess he was pretty persistent about it, and 
She eventually gave in and it was happy she did. <laughs> yeah. I think it was kind of love at first sight. Yeah, that But little... she was trying to resist. <laughs> because of her religious, deeply religious back. You know, gra my grandmother was deeply religious. She didn't like blues too much then, I don't think. And then after they really got together and really started to see each other often, then she began to like the blues. She kind of took over the business part of his band. And she, she did a really good job at it. She was excellent at it. And in fact, you know, Wolf ended up being, he had one of the most business-like bands ever. He actually paid unemployment insurance for his guys. Yeah, I think the stability of things and to have someone who did have some education, who could watch numbers and contracts and, you know, business deals and, and et cetera. They were just two people in love. <laughs> <laughs> and he would tell you, I have a wife at home and she feeds me with a golden spoon. He was good for her. He worshipped her. Uh, uh, you know, they were good for each yeah, other. He was. It was completion for her because uh, Mama was so totally total when when they were together. Oh, she was a beautiful lady, man. She was really dedicated to Wolf and everything. She just was a a nice person, you know. Wolf had a nice family, man. Now, hey. One of these houses here. Wait, I'm a, I, I, wait, I'll find out the exact house. I don't want to put the hang on. I'll find out the exact house. Hey, how you doing there? What one of these houses the Wolf used to live in? I know he was on the second floor. All I know he was on the second floor, and it was on this side of the street. I know, I know it was in one of these buildings here because they was on the second floor. Howling Wolf, did you do? You don't forget. Uh -huh. He was on this side of the street. Let's go and see. Let's walk down here. Well, I was living here, and I don't forget. I, I moved here. I moved here so I wouldn't have, you know, because I was playing with him, and I didn't want to uh -huh. have to go back cross town. And I think there's a possibility it could have been here. A possibility. Where? This building. Possibly. This building here. the entrance right here. Where you the okay, in the bar, the right in where it looked like you see a tree stump, that was the bar that goes to leads, but it was a walkway to the back. Over here were some tables and chairs. By where this cup is and this little hump, that's where the little bandstand was. And in the muddy waters when they played here, he would stand down on the floor. But mainly, Wolf would put him a chair like right here. Fifty cents to get in there, and nobody didn't want to pay it. I would give fifty cents to go see Elvis Presley, you know. And the guard at the door would have to, a lot of times, put people out because he wanted to come in without paying fifty cents. A blues bar is basically a neighborhood tavern. It might be a little bit bigger. Then people were drinking a lot. 
They were not using drugs, just drinking a lot. And when they would drink, then they would get loud and they would dance. It was background music for having a ball. They used knives then. Not too much a gunfight, knives. They would, uh, you know, like they would be drinking and they would, I guess, get all teed up. And when they get outside, they would see their wives or their girlfriends talking to someone and then they want to fight. Sylvia always had two cops in the place, you know, door shakers, they call them, uh, uh, private cars uh, in the place. And I always felt that it was just a little bit repressed, but you never heard of anybody getting hurt or threatened or anything at Sylvia's. Sylvia had all these bands, Thunder Boy Band, Muddy Waters Band, uh, Memphis Slim Band. They, they had all these Eddie Boys Band. They had everybody. There was a time when he had Muddy and Wolf. He said, I gotta hire two bands to make sure I have one. This is when they were starting to play colleges and things. And I remember one night, uh, he had Muddy and Wolf plus Magic Sam with Shaky Jake on intermissions. He would tell his musician, you cannot drink as long as you play. But after the show, you'll be able to do anything you wanna do and I will buy it for you. time he followed with me is when I didn't show up at the studio to record. I was late a lot of times. Because we had played 5 o'clock in the morning, and sometimes, man, we'd be kind of high, then drinking all the booze, and everything had been chased them girls, and you want to go home. You know what I'm saying? You're sleeping, you don't want to wake up. We went to record, shake it for me. And at 8 o'clock, we had to be in the studio. I got there at noon. May have been 1 o'clock. Because they had three more guitar players. They done sent to L.A. And they flew all the way from California there to be on Shake It For Me, you know? And could never cut the mustard. So Chess, he didn't cut. He wanted to cuss me, man. He wanted to, he was mad. I saw him change colors, man. He said, hey, how you feeling? Brought me some black coffee and everything. We'll say, hey, man. Let's get this number over with. I want to go home and go to bed. No, I want to go home and eat and go to bed, man. I've been up too. What you had, you know? Got that diddle-up? That's it. One time. <laughs> we didn't have to go back over it, man. Just the way it was. Just the dumb guy looked at me, man, and Chess and them looked at me, and, and I saw him smile. I said, uh -huh. this, is, this is what it's all about. You know what I'm talking about? I said, but I'm sorry, y'all, by being late. <laughs> a prophet is uh, sort of not recognized in his own country. These guys went overseas, and they were treated like big stars, and it was a, it was a thrill for him. When I first went over there with him in uh, 1964, the American Folk Blues Festival, well, when we come down off the airplane and, and in, in Frankfurt, Germany, we went straight to this studio. I'd been in a, on a few sound stages, and it was the biggest stage I've ever been on. It was enormous. It was a block and a half long. I mean, it's large. Sure look good.
At the television show and everything, we went to traveling. We went to going Germany, France, and all over whilst we was there, you know, England, uh, ever, we did everything. <laughs> To me, that was pushing them a little bit more. I wanted to see them go farther. And when he showed back up from over there, we had the finest underwear. I know, we'd have some and wonderful gifts. <laughs> fishnet stockings and texture stockings. Someone helped him buy these things, but had such lovely gifts for the all of us. As a matter of fact, I still have some of those little girl Do slips you? and things okay. till today. Finest material, you know, stuff that never wore out. You just couldn't fit them anymore. <laughs> See, we were playing for black audiences in the 50s and the, the early 60s. And when the black audiences stopped listening to the records, stopped buying the records, then the blues sort of, you know, petered down a little bit. And the blues audience shrunk. The club scene was less. It was before the white audience discovered the blues. But Wolf worked right through it. I think of the period of the white rock audience and the black blues performers getting in sync with each other is a little, it takes a few years and it's a dance because you have these electric blues men who spark an interest among this folk blues audience. And so as the folk blues audience is beginning to transform itself into an electric blues audience, the, at the same time, most of the electric blues performers are 
trying to reach the folk blues audience through folk blues. So you have this period where they're trying to get in, in line with each other, which they finally do. Let me see my little red rooster, darling, I want you please drive him home. If anybody sees my little red rooster, baby, please drive him home. Had no peace in the farmyard since my little red rooster been gone. Probably the greatest example of that is when the Stones appear on Shindig and bring on Wolf. You know, there, and there it is, everybody's in sync now. I met the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, uh, Eric Burden, uh, the Kinks, the Yardbirds, they were all blues fanatics, you know? They saw him as a teacher and he saw himself right. as a teacher to them. I would often hear him say, my little boy Mick Jagger. Yeah, I'm saying uh, that's you what know, I want that's to what say. He I think would he, say. he was didn't tell superior, he was, but no. father, more father like that. Yeah. He was teaching Never them some thought, things. They will even tell you that they looked up to him. Yeah, openly. yeah, you no, know, I they don't looked think. up to him. I mean, Hubert was the idol of Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton and, you know, uh, Keith Richards and Jimmy Page and all of those electric guitar players from the 60s. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Newport 66, you know, Alan Lomax got, and the festival uh, organizers got some of the great old Delta people uh, back together again. That ha happened several years in a row. Sun House was there, and uh, Bucka White, you know, the great old Delta players. We would plan up till Friday night. We'd go out on one of them big plantation, and we would have a contest. If one would do the best playing, they didn't have no money. They'd give us a rooster, a hen. Sometime, if a fella had enough pig, he'd give you a pig, he said, to start you off with. Sometime the judge would give it to Skip James. Sometime he would give it to Sun House. Sometime the judge would give it to me. And then, of course, at the same time, you had people like Bob Dylan and, you know, Joan Baez and, uh, you know, the Paul Butterfield Blues Band and uh, all of the, the young Turks of the 60s. And they were meeting these old guys, uh, these legendary old blues men. Alan Lomax set up a uh, kind of a, a, a juke joint sort of a situation backstage and invited all these great Delta blues musicians to come in and, uh, and play their stuff as if they were back in a juke joint in the 1930s. Have a time, my baby, stop that still. You may see the twice, bring it on a little ball. Look like they needed that enough. Well, I need somebody. Please, ma'am, please, ma'am. Do that old bullet for me. Old bullet for me. When I hit it like that, you see that crank up there started trimming. That's said, look like all the way in that money. You got to play it before they pull that curtain. But when I ran back down on it like this, I see them two men coming swinging over to me. I 
it was sort of a friendly, you know, contest where he was trying to uh, outdo Bucca and show him up. It was really amazing what Alan Lomax did setting up that film and getting those old guys together. One of the only problems, though, was that uh, somebody gave Sun House a bunch of whiskey, and Sun House didn't need too much whiskey to get drunk, and he got just blasted. All kinds of blues, rabbit blues, chicken blues, of any kind of blues, there's the name of blues. They say it, but that's not the blues. The blues consisted between a male and female. Wolf knew Sun House really well at one point, uh, 30 years before that, let's say, or 25 years before that. For 10 or 15 years, uh, Sun House had been living in upstate New York, uh, or Rochester, and he had been working as a uh, Pullman porter, and he had basically not been playing music. So uh, During Wolf's segment, he started making noise, and he interrupted uh, Wolf's performance, and that's one thing that Wolf would not put up with. See, this man got the blues right there. See, that's why the blues come from, because he done drunk up all of his. <laughs> and he would. I'm telling you like it here now. Well, you see, you, you had a chance with your life, but you ain't done nothing with it. See, and you got to have the blues. We ain't talking about the women. We're talking about the life of a human being, how they live. See, now you don't love but one thing, and that's some whiskey. No, See, and that's plum out of it. I don't love more than whiskey, but I want some. Now, she ain't whiskey. <laughs> yeah, for him to see Sun House as an old man being uh, kind of a, uh, a sloppy drunk, I think that bothered Wolf. I think Wolf was really disappointed in what Sun House had turned into. Now this is the blues here. You see when a man gets scared, done been in some man's house, and he knew he wrong for being in there, and the man catch him in there, or the woman catch her in there, and she have to run off and leave her shoes, you know. She gonna call back to Mary, or he gonna call back to Joe, tell Willie to bring my running shoes, cause I'm barefooted. Well, now meet me at the bottom. Bring me my running shoes.
that guy learned his guitar. He showed me some chords, man, that I, I couldn't believe was made on the guitar. I talked to uh, Van Shaw, who was also an excellent guitarist, and he said that Wolf was one of the greatest slide players he ever heard. And he said he was, Wolf was great by today's standards, not by the standards of back then. He said he couldn't figure out how Wolf got so good because um, he was phenomenal. I remember it. Oh, yeah. I remember this. Oh, this bring back some things to me. His mother was a religious person, kind of a religious fanatic. And he had lost contact with her for years and years, you know, maybe a decade or so. And then one time he came down to Clarksdale on one of his many tours of the Delta. We stopped at a barber shop in Clarksdale on our way back to Chicago. And so these people know Wolf Mama. They know this mother. <laughs> this guy went and got his mama. <laughs> I'm looking at her, I, and Wolf, oh, mama. Started crying, man. I, I have never seen a $500 bill in my life. But that's, I saw one. Wolf, for all this money up, I didn't know that's what it was, man. She had on the apron, big apron crying, and then yeah, they hugged one another about the 15 or 20 minutes. She was cussing them out, man, tying me loose, and she taking that money, and mother must have felt that money in that apron. Took it out, and I and, and stomped it, man. And, and it opened up when she stomped, I'm looking at a big old $500 bill, I said, oh, Lord, that was a $500 bill. And she thought that Wolf was singing the devil's music, and she didn't want to have anything to do with him. She walked off and left the money. Left us. Now, you can imagine what this Wolf, what this did to Wolf's head. It was the first time he had seen his mother in maybe 10 years or so. The wolf cried all the way to Memphis. Please ride my mother. Tell her all the shape I'm in. The kidney problem started on a New Year's morning on the way from work, and they were, he was hit from behind. Not a serious accident, it seems, but I understand certain things can trigger a failed kidney, and, and it did start out like that. You know, they looked for him a kidney uh, almost 10 years. Uh, for, uh, for a donor, but they never, they never found one. My mother arranged for him to work and have dialysis every right. place and see doctors and everything. He was okay. My mother used to do it in the basement of our house. We had something that looked like a washing machine that took all his blood dialysis out, cleans it. I know, but it seemed like a big dryer in a larger bed or a washing machine. And she would. Uh, put him on the machine like three times a week. And he was doing good, but his heart just wouldn't take the strain. He had two heart attacks. And he, he, he got the, oh, he got over them. 
He got over. He was so dedicated to his profession, he really should have taken it easy sooner than he did. Yeah. He would not stop. The doctors asked would he stop, he, he wouldn't stop. This is one of the amazing things about Wolf. I mean, he was willing to go out there to the very end and play his music. He wasn't gonna let some little thing like no kidneys stop him. I don't hate no If I never get well no more, I done had my fun. And if I never get well no more. Yes, I'm just going down slow. I started booking some shows at the University of Chicago, blues shows over there. So I called Wolf to see if he would come do a, a dance at the university, and he said, well, you'll need to talk to my manager, um, but come on over for dinner. and. Uh, you know, that sounded like pretty wonderful to me. Here's the Howlin' Wolf, and he lived in this nice little brick bungalow and plastic covers on the furniture, nicely kept, tidy, nice backyard and all this kind of stuff. And uh, Lily cooked me the first of a number of really nice dinners. Not everybody could come, but once he made a friend, you were welcome to spend the night, to partake of the food, to drink, you know what I'm saying? I always knew every minute I was around him, I, I was fully conscious of what a blessing it was to have that opportunity and what a privilege and um, what a unique person he was. If you see my little red rooster, please drive him home. Wolf liked to appeal to the broadest audience possible. You know, he was an entertainer, and so he had no problems trying to appeal to, you know, um, the white audience. In the early 70s, there was an attempt by Chess Records to put their Delta Blues artists in a European environment with white rock players um, to kind of create, I think it was successful, to create a door in to the blues. I was involved in, in helping the chess company expand our audience. Again, we were the record business, so it wasn't help Wolf make more money, it was help the label make more money so we could pay the damn overhead and also give the artists more royalties. And that's why he did that London album with uh, Eric Clapton and uh, a couple of the guys in the Stones, Ringo Starr, Stevie Winwood. Actually, of all those albums, I think the one with Wolf is the most successful. And I think that they serve the purpose of uh, someone whose ear is not trained for blues has a way in. Oh, that was great. You know, Chess them didn't want me to go. They, they really didn't want me to go over there because they, they, they want the Rolling Stones. The story is that uh, Clapton didn't want to do this thing unless Hubert was invited along. That he called in Chess Brothers and told them, say, hey, man, if Hubert don't be there, I won't either. And they had a doctor with Wolf 24 hours. And two nights, Wolf couldn't, couldn't record. I guess when he was recording it, he could only record for a couple of hours a day. But we did the album in eight days. I was taken when Eric Clapton gave Wolf a fishing rod. He knew that Wolf liked to fish and hunt. And Wolf was genuinely touched. And when they did Little Red Rooster, I was in the control room and it was moving the way Clapton and Wolf had that interplay. I think it's a great album, actually. Uh, 
I don't know why anybody would criticize it because I think it's, you know, some of Wolf's best performances considering the shape he was in and the band behind him, it was great. I mean, they're spectacular. Sure enough, you're even out in London sold more records than I think any blues artist sold at that time. 900,000? I think all of the attempts of chess to expand the audience outside of the core black early blues audience were great things. I think even though the blues fundamentalists today put down those experiments or those attempts to spread the music, they're part of why blues, Wolf, Muddy, Walter are part of the American folk culture of today. I don't hate my mom. And if I never get well no more, I done had my fun. And if I never get well no more. His last few, few years were really heroic. He would do some of his old stunts, you know, every once in a while, and um, he didn't have a whole lot of energy, but when he did, uh, he, was still, he was still great. And sometimes I'd see him and he'd be truly inspired. Other nights he'd be sort of laboring. And one thing about him, I mean, he put whatever he had into the music. But it seemed like well, his singing was just as good as ever. Towards the end of his life, he actually did one last big show at the Chicago Amphitheater with B.B. Uh, King and uh, a bunch of other big stars on the bill. We had about uh, 10 or 11 bands there. And Wolf went out and gave just an incredible performance. He did a lot of his old tricks. Uh, crawling around on his hands and knees, which must have been really painful. Crawling on his back at one point during Crawling King Snake. And uh, he gave just a tremendous performance, and he got a, a five-minute standing ovation. And he took that show. He took it that night. And he was so tired afterwards that uh, his wife had to call the paramedics. She had to call in the paramedics to sort of revive him. The next night, he played at the 1815 Club, like he always did when he wasn't doing anything else. And we all went over and saw Wolf, and it was obvious that he was pretty fatigued, that he'd extended himself at the, the big show the night before. But he did get through the night, but supposedly right after that was when he went into the hospital and he never, he never played again. Please write my mother. Going Down Slow, which was written by St. Louis Jimmy Oden, um, was a song that Wolf took really personally because um, uh, a lot of it is about talking to his mother as he's, you know, as he's dying. And in fact, that did happen to Wolf. He wanted to see his mother, and she wouldn't come and visit him. And I remember him asking, and my mom offered to send a limousine, send a plane, but she refused. She always said he sang the devil's music, you know. You tell my mother, don't send me no doctor. The doctor can't do me no good. Tell my mother to don't send me no doctor. Oh, the doctor can't do me no good. You just tell us all my fault. 
They were estranged at the time of his death, you know, which was really uh, sad because he wanted to see her near the end. N near the end, there was a brain tumor found, and they did surgery, and they didn't find that until the very end, I would say about uh, three days before he passed, because he had surgery, we would say about that Wednesday mm -hmm. before that Saturday. His, his heart was just too bad to really undergo brain surgery, but, but he they did. had to. But he did. And of course, as I said, he never came out mm -hmm. of it because uh, that anesthesia is known that you can't, with a bad heart, go under. I didn't want to believe nothing, not in dying, you know, not him. I figured he's going to come through everything. I was the last family member to see him the morning he passed. He still looked like himself. He was still, it wasn't that he diminished down, uh, but he was a sick man. And all in all, he was yeah. still proud. He still, he did it with dignity. And uh, when he passed, uh, Leonard Chess owned WVON, so he played his records all day on the radio, the Hollow Wolf passed. And there was a lot of people as awake. It was jam-packed, you know. Uh, it was a sad day. Dad, you know. was an, a great original blues artist that affected all of blues music. I don't remember when it just really hit me. This is amazing, and I really do think it now that it is truly amazing, you know. In a way, I feel like I'm hearing the best of the essence of humanity, and by that I mean a person that had a, a rough road to hoe in life and turned it into something of um, great, it's a form of beauty, so I'll say beauty, and something haunting, something memorable, something that enabled him to carve a better life out for himself. Um, I, hear so, I hear magic in his music. He contributed all he could to the music, and, and again, and he did double for his family. He just, he was always, you know, just so family-oriented, I, I, and it probably goes back to not having a close family, you know, relationship when he was a child, but he was on it, he was on it. Most of all, he loved my mom, he made her happy. That was number one. And we still love you. Yeah. <laughs> I still think he's here right now. You can feel things. You can feel these things. At least I do.